Good morning. This is Brett Smith, Director of Technology at the Center for Automotive Research. And welcome to our webinar today, a simulation driven approach to accelerating e mobility development. <clears throat> this morning's webinar is a an affiliate webinar by the Center for Automotive Research. Again, my name is Brett Smith, Director of Technology at the Center for Automotive Research. Today we have Lars Fredrickson. Business Vice President, Simulation Driven Innovation with Altair Engineering, and Jean Michel Terrier, Vice President, Radios Business and RD with Altair Engineering. I've been asked to introduce this topic and to um, make a few comments. I will do that. And then immediately after my comments, Lars and Jean Michel will, will give their presentations. Um, and at that point, we'll have questions after Jean-Michel is finished. I, um, as I was preparing for this presentation yesterday, I actually was on a phone call, or FaceTime with another organization, with se several other organizations, and we were talking about how um, the, the time challenge has become so important in terms of product development getting a product from idea to marketplace. And, and I, I, I chuckled to myself and thought, 20 years ago, my old uh, CEO, Dave, Dr. David Cole, used to use a slide that showed time getting compressed. And I thought that is still today as, as pertinent, if as simple as it was 20 years ago. This industry go, is going through a continual compression of development time. Um, and that that time that that, that that need to get somewhere faster, to get somewhere better, to get somewhere smarter, seems to magnify as the technologies change. One of the areas that I think is very visible, this time compression is visible, is what's happening in electric vehicles. Um, it's almost impossible to talk about electric vehicles without first at least talking about the sales. And, and this is a a chart from back in the days when the hybrid electric vehicles started, the Prius and the Insight, through to um, the first four months of this year. I think it's valuable to look at the first four months of this year and, and look at both electric vehicles, battery electric vehicle sales, and electric vehicle, electrified vehicle sales, and, and as a share of um, market and they have this year gone down a slight bit over last year. Battery electrics down just a tiny bit, but they're still um, holding fairly steady. Uh, lots of questions as we come into this pandemic as to whether with incredibly low gas prices and incredibly um, high unemployment rates, if electrified vehicles will be able to sell going forward. I think that that's certainly that is very much uncertain, but I think it's worth considering a few different parts to this. Um, and and maybe taking a different look at it, it's interesting when you look at electrified sales through April, they were one of the least or one of the best performing segments out there. Um, only pickup trucks performed better. Pickup trucks performed remarkably good um, for the first four months of this year, given given what's happening. Everything else was hit pretty hard. Um, electrified, though, hit less hard than a lot of the others. So many um, dynamics would suggest that electrified vehicles, specifically in this case, battery electric vehicles, would really struggle in sales going for, through this pandemic, through this recession. And that still may play out to be true. But it is interesting to take a look and say, you know, out of all those segments, only pickup trucks fared better. And I think um, when, when we talk about what's coming, it is interesting to look at the electrified vehicle, the battery electric vehicle world, and say, you know, yes, gasoline prices are cheap. Yes, unemployment is high. All of those are absolutely gonna affect vehicle sales. 
And reasonably, you could argue they would affect electrified battery electric sales even more. Um, but on the flip side, there are some really interesting products coming out, the Model Y, the Mach-E, and the and, and, uh, uh, Concept um, ID4. Curious, they do all look remarkably alike, don't they? As they put this together, I noticed that these vehicles are almost one and the same vehicle, but they are that next generation of electric vehicles, that generation that's, that's kind of focused at maybe higher volumes, maybe, um, actually making some headway into the market into a very challenging market right now and um on the uh, other side of the ocean where, where both of our speakers are today um it is interesting that there is a shift happening in europe yes it is driven by 95 grams per kilo per kilo kilometer regulation very very severe change in regulation over the last uh, six months um but it is happening i, I saw First four months of 2020, 20% of Porsches sold in Western Europe had a plug. Uh, electrified vehicles, from what I've seen in Europe, have increased 61% this year. There are things happening. So even in the even in the hardest of times for this industry, and times when you'd think that there would be some some real stress in the electrified world, there are things that make it happen. So I want to switch away from the electrified vehicle to more of and I told Lars and um, Jean-Michel I was going to go a really different direction today. I want to go back to um, transitions and new ways of thinking. This is, of course, one of the classic North American automobiles, the family truckster, Clark Griswold's truck car uh, that he drove across country. It is a, a great example of what the US auto industry did well in the 70s. Body on frame, big, Lots of steel, lots of lots of lots of room, um, but with the fuel economy uh, requirements that went into effect in the late 70s and the 80s, the auto industry had to shift. And I will argue, and a lot of a lot of a lot of backup research on this, um, the U.S. auto industry struggled in that conversion. They did body on frame very well. They did not have great experience, although they did, although they did do some unibody, they did not have a lot of experience in it. Um, this is maybe my all-time favorite uh, Fortune uh, magazine cover, partly because, yes, in fact, I owned two of those cars. I owned a Buick and an Oldsmobile, and I thought they were different. Looking at it, clearly they weren't different. Um, but they were really not great cars. And there's a good reason for that. You ask engineers, good engineers, even great engineers, to do something very different than they've done in the past, you have a real problem. And this uh, converting from body on frame to unibodies uh, contributed to poor quality and lots of lost customers. I would argue that maybe we're at another point uh, in that product development inflection point. And the question I have is, do we need different sk tools, skills, strategies to develop these EVs? Um, as we look at what we're doing now as an industry, yes, F-150s, Sierras, Silverados are selling phenomenally well. And their, their sister vehicles, this SUV, large SUVs. Um, but to make an EV really good, really well to do the product as good as you're doing a truck may take a couple of iterations, will take a couple of iterations, and may take very different tools. And so as with that background, I'd like to hand it over to Lars Fredrickson and Jean-Michel will follow Lars to talk about some of the different tools and strategies and, and technology or, and, and ideas for developing um, e-mobility. Lars, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Brett. So can everyone, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Brett, again, and, and good morning, everyone. And uh, as Brett said, I will take you through uh, the next uh, sections of, of this uh, webinar, starting with a small overview of, of uh, automotive at Alter, then talking a little bit more about efficient e-motor development, 
and then uh, a little bit about extending vehicle range. And for that, I will focus a lot on light weighting, since also for e-mobility, we believe that light weighting is, is, is one way and one significant way also to, to uh, make something about uh, extending the range. After me, then Jean-Michel will take over and talk about, about crash and safety, especially for, for batteries here. So for those of, of now you who, who doesn't know Altair, just one slide uh, talking about Altair, uh, funded 1985. We are now a global company. We even went to the to the stock market a few years ago, serving a lot of customers, uh, thousands of customers in the area of of uh, product development, providing services and software in order to make it more time efficient, uh, better and and uh, make it easier in general to, to develop uh, products. The offering of Altair is, is very broad. If you look at what we are providing, we are providing tools in the area of product development, ranging from modeling and visualization, going through physics simulations and optimizations. And now since a few years, we are also offering solutions for, for data intelligence, internet of things, Etc. Etc. Some of these products are more more uh, well known to you. Maybe some of you have heard about, or many of you have heard about Hypermesh in the area of modeling, and maybe Optistruct in the area of physics simulations. But the the portfolio of Antar is extremely broad nowadays. We cover a large range of, of different different uh, challenges for the, uh, especially the automotive industry. And when we talk about the automotive industry, which is uh, the main topic. Of, of this webinar and especially e-mobility. Uh, of course, Altair was grown up with, with uh, automotive and comes from automotive and a lot of solutions, products and, and processes we create are very much aligned to, to fit with uh, automotive development. And since a few years, we're concentrating a lot on making these products and, and solutions fit especially to e-mobility as well. Uh, almost all automotive OEMs are using our products and or our, our uh, uh, engineering services. This slide should, however, uh, tell you something different, that we are also very much engaged uh, with some customers to provide, let's say, quite big scale solutions where Altair is engaged very much uh, within uh, the area of, of either deploying these solutions at the OEM or directly using the solutions to, to help our customers to design and develop the cars. So up left, up left you see an example from Ferrari where we are since five, six years now uh, supporting their concept development, ranging up to the far right, upright, where we supported the uh, successor of Saab to develop an uh, electric platform, including uh, battery develop, battery tray development. And, and, and down left, you see uh, where we are working a lot with, for example, companies like AMG to develop uh, electric motors. And, and these examples are also very much aligned with the topics we will talk about uh, later today. So when we are, are engaged with such clients and, and, and such uh, challenges, a lot of the uh, a lot of what we do is, is of course, related to simulation-driven design and simulation-driven design as one of the uh, uh, part of the, the webinar name today is, of course, extremely important, uh, we believe, for the future and extremely important for, for vehicle development. So simulation-driven design uh, defined the way we do it at Altair is that we want to engage with the, with the clients much more intensively on the design side, providing simulations and optimizations to drive design instead of just uh, verifying or validating designs who, which have been developed uh, with other ways with traditional CAD or, or design methods. So we want to be very actively engaged in the design process. So that's our definition of simulation-driven design. In order to make simulation-driven design uh, successful, you need, first of all, a very strong uh, set of tools where you can cover different physics, because when we talk about simulation-driven design, 
in many cases we need to uh, consider a lot of different physics and we need to have solutions to, to address all these different physics. But that's not all. We also need uh, the way to combine these physics. We need a way to develop uh, and find uh, and uh, uh, get decision material out from the simulations of these physics. And we do that with the help of optimization. The optimization, either linear or nonlinear optimization, is helping us provide decision material and decision input for, for uh, the, the design guys when we are working with simulation driven design. So um, the solvers and, and the optimization tools and processes, let's say, go hand in hand. And uh, with this together, we can address a lot of different uh, simulation and, and challenges related to, to e-mobility. So on this screen, you see uh, some of the challenges we're addressing. Uh, some of them are classical, let's say classical areas of alter as light weighting, NVH and crash and safety. Others are a little bit newer. We will talk about them as well today uh, concerning e-motor development, uh, EMI connectivity, maybe energy efficiency. So uh, we are now working very intensively in all of these areas and developing solutions related to, to that. These solutions, if you look how they look like, uh, they are, as we said, a combination of, of uh, using our best solvers for the different physics, uh, integrating that with our optimization technology and coming up with solutions. So these solutions can look in different ways. They can be single physics solutions or they can be multi-physics solutions. For single physics solutions, we have quite, let's say, ready to go uh, products and, and more or less integrated solutions. When it comes to multi-physics, their situation is a little bit more complex, and but Alter is, is working very close to both uh, OEMs and suppliers to develop, uh, let's say, processes and solutions to address strong multi-physics uh, problems. And we will see some examples of that, especially in the e-motor area. We are working with many different physics, and there we can't rely directly only on, on the products directly, but we need to create, let's say, tailored processes which address these challenges, uh, especially. Uh, just a few points, what's important uh, when we create these solutions. Of course, multi-physics is very important for simulation-driven design in general, because in our world, simulation-driven design also means considering, if possible, all the different physics together and simultaneous and not doing the uh, development in serial or, uh, let's say, uh, after each other. Everything should be done simultaneously, if possible. We rely a lot on, on optimization and design exploration. And of course, as I said, when we get into complex processes, these complex processes are, are uh, we need tailored processes and tailored and automated and automations, which make these processes more efficient in the end. So let me now uh, go to the, to the main topics of today. So I will talk a little bit about e-motor design, how we can make that more efficiently. Then a few words about extending range. Uh, for me, that has a lot to do with light weighting. And then uh, from Michelle, we'll talk more about uh, batteries and crash and safety related to batteries. So look at this slide. So this connects very lot to the slides I've shown before. Uh, when working with e-motor design, we are confronted with a lot of different physics. Traditionally, these physics have been treated uh, separately in siloed uh, way, uh, often uh, treated by different departments, maybe even sitting at different locations. And what we want to do is to say, okay, we need to make it possible uh, to uh, do this in a more efficient and, and synchro synchronized way. So we want to have a simultaneous development of all attributes at the same time where it makes sense. And that's where we see that multi-physics uh, play a very important role. So uh, the, the baseline development process, you could, you could say, look like this. If you have a, a design of a motor, in this case, we see a rotor geometry or a part, a slice of a rotor geometry on the screen. If we have that, 
we want to change that in certain ways and then we want to do simulations on this and we want to so to speak say uh, check the design we have if we are satisfied with the design we are uh, good to go however if we are not satisfied we need to change the geometry and change the design until we're happy so this can be formalized into a kind of optimization process uh, it's easy or quite easy as long as we are looking at one physics however uh, this is getting more complicated as you start to look at, at different physics for example if we are looking at strength if we are looking at at cooling aspects of such a motor then we end up with a with a multi-physics problem and we need special processes and special methodologies and best practice to to deal with this type of of uh, challenge and uh, this is something we do uh, very much within altair so the combination of solvers with optimization technology is let's say a core part of simulation driven design and uh, what you see on this screen is is uh, uh, hyperstudy as an optimization tool or environment in the middle and around that you have a lot of different solvers and where you can you can uh, investigate a lot of different attributes some of these solvers are already very well connected with uh, with our optimization tools for example if you want to just look at electromagnetics then we have so-called connectors and these connectors means that you can actually start and run optimization more or less directly or make it very easy if you're using flux and, and solving the electromagnetic problem. These type of connectors exist for a lot of different products at Altair. However, when you start getting a little bit more complex problems, like let's say you want to look at, at the NVH uh, uh, properties of a motor together with the electromagnetic properties of a motor, and you want to do that in, in simultaneously, then you need, you can say, a, a more formal process to do that. And this type of process is uh, something we build up on a daily basis, and we get a lot of experience now working with different companies uh, to, to uh, develop and test these processes and make them more and more efficient. The question is, what happens if you want to do this in a very general way? So, uh, of course, we want to treat not only two physics but we want to have a situation where we uh, maybe are looking at cooling as i said we're looking at electromagnetics we're looking at nvh we're looking at statics uh, we are looking at many different aspects of the motor development and we want to do that efficiently so this means that we need a kind of multi-physics tool or multi-physics environment which is able able to do that and that's something we are developing right now at Altair. Uh, we are working with something called eMotor Director. Uh, it's very exciting development where we uh, create an environment which uh, is able to more or less take any solver, uh, define a study uh, using models from different solvers, connecting everything together and create, let's say, a a DOE study or a multi-physics study considering all these solvers and, and problems simultaneously. And what comes out of such a DOE is of course uh, something that can be used efficiently to do design exploration. So you can, you can do negotiation between electromagnetic properties of the motor and NVH properties of the motor considering cooling considering maybe control and, and power electronics aspect at the motor at the same time. So the e-motor director is not a, a solver in that sense. It just brings the different physics together and lets you incorporate all these physics into a big optimization problem. And when you have executed this optimization problem in, in form of an of DOE, you can use the output to, to do efficient design exploration. So just two very important aspects of what you need to, to do this and to do this efficiently is to have a very, very simple way of setting up uh, these type of, of multi-physics studies. And there we are looking at, at a kind of dashboard uh, way of setting up. So you are dragging and dropping different tasks upon your screen. So in this case, we are working with an electric motor and we are 
uh, defining different working points which we want to investigate and for for example when working point number one we are looking both at the thermal problem and we also want to investigate the stresses and these let's say you can call them small black boxes which are the different tasks they are tasks uh, which are executed in in certain orders and when you have executed them you get all the data and responses you need to to be able to uh, judge if your motor is let's say good or bad so with this type of drag and drop system and 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 workbench you can call it you can easily define more or less any type of of study including mechanics including electro magnetics including nvh including thermal uh, as long as you have predefined these uh, different tasks in a kind of task library in the beginning the second very important aspect of uh, simulation driven design in multiphysics is to assure that the geometry you are using when you're doing these studies is the same for all different uh, physics and this is a very common problem as we have seen in the industry, not only related to e-motors, we all often see that the NVH guy has his own model, the electromagnetics guy has his own model, the cooling guys has their models. However, if you want to do synchronous development and multiphysics development, you need to assure that all these departments are acting on the same model and doing optimization using the same design changes for all the different physics. And this is something we also addressing uh, with this type of e-motor director problem so that more or less uh, shows you a little bit of, of where we're heading with a uh, very broad general e-motor uh, uh, director or e-motor development uh, i have a video showing this i don't know if it's possible to to see this maybe the uh, the uh, uh, rate of of uh, uh, or the bandwidth is not big enough to, to do that. So I skip that video, go to the next topic to talk a little bit about, more about uh, extending vehicle range and about light weighting. So uh, many of you know light weighting. Light weighting is not a new topic. It has been going on for many, many years. In the beginning, uh, most companies were engaged with doing material light weighting. Uh, later, we turned into other light weighting uh, categories with shape light weighting, production light weighting, etc. etc. Concept light weighting more or less deals with, with uh, finding new load paths and finding new ways of, of creating uh, the, the load carrying structures of the car. But what we are focusing right now is integrated light weighting, which means light weighting where we try to consider all the different aspects. And what we see when we are working with integrated light weighting is that, uh, sorry, uh, that the simulation driven design principles get more and more important the more and more you get into integrated light weighting. Because integrated light weighting means also here you need to, you need to uh, engage all the different attribute departments which are, are uh, controlling the, the, uh, the attributes of the car. So NVH, uh, fatigue, statics, crash, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in order to be able to develop uh, lightweight in, uh, a lightweight car uh, in an efficient way. So that's what we are dealing with: integrated lightweighting. And there we have solutions both uh, concerning, let's say, part on the part and systems level. Uh, there we're often, often uh, working directly and integrating directly with design departments or we are working uh, with big solution which you see a little bit grayed out here which i will come back to uh, in a few seconds so uh, when it comes to let's say the part and systems based uh, simulation driven design and light weighting there uh, in the altair portfolio there are some uh, especially design products which have been created to serve the purpose of simulation driven design uh, maybe the most important one is is inspire and inspire is actually not one product but it's a set of products to be used very close to design or also by designers in order to uh, for them uh, to 
create first uh, designs on their own, which they then can get evaluated by, uh, by uh, CIE experts. So here you see, I hope you see it on the screen, here you see a, a, a small video on the approach uh, of and the, uh, the methodology of INSPIRE. It has a very simple and, and easy to learn interface and with this interface you can do uh, type topology optimization. You can look where your load paths should be. When you have your load paths created, you can uh, go on and, and realize these load paths with quite efficient methods. So this is a kind of, uh, you, you wrap a kind of polynerbs around these structures which came out of the optimization and you can refine that as you go and this takes you to a more and more uh, ready product, which is in the end also manufacturable. So this should be a, a tool or is a tool which efficiently uh, supports the, the, uh, the process used by the designer to develop the tools. So with this type of design, we can then, if necessary, uh, either uh, take it into a detailed design process or and or get it checked by by CIE people for if we need more detailed confirmation of that. So if you look at, at larger systems and, and complete vehicle bodies, platforms and architectures, uh, we don't have, let's say, ready to go product to deal with that, but we create more tailored solutions to be able to support uh, OEMs uh, developing uh, bodies uh, more efficiently, of course, looking at, at uh, light weighting as a, as a primary attribute but when we are working with light weighting of course we need to assure that all the other attributes and uh, the technical attributes and the, the cost is under control and that we can do such a development within a, a decent time frame so just a few examples of of very big macro solutions for automotive light weighting there we are working uh, a lot with a process we call uh, C123, which is aimed to be uh, support for the early concept development and uh, for the uh, mainstream development, series development. We are working a lot with, with DOE and MDO-based processes. Uh, there we have created a, a quite ready-to-go tool, which is called Altair MDO Director, which is aimed to support multi-physics and multidisciplinary uh, optimization in the, in the in the mainstream and serious development. Uh, both these types of developments are are continuous, and the aim and goal is to get as much as of of the let's say the tools and the processes and methodologies we develop here in in the core product. But uh, to be honest, it's also like this that these are processes, and so it's not only tools, but uh, they have to be combined with best practice and, and uh, a process way of working in order to be successful. Just a few words about C123. Uh, C123 is, a, is, as I said, a concept development process where you go from early load path development, where you take more or less a, a design space, you go and take the packaging, and when you combine these, uh, you have an allowable design space. And from that design space, you can then develop the load path structures. Here we have developed technology and methodology to do this efficiently, not only considering one body, but maybe a family of bodies, a complete architecture, a platform. And we can do trade-offs between, uh, let's say, carryover strategies uh, when developing this type of, of, of structures. Then we take this into a little bit more detailed or a more detailed way of looking at it. We have what we call intelligent B models, where we're working a lot with parametric optimization to be able to develop the cross sections, the cross section properties, and the uh, how the cross section look like. Uh, so this is done efficiently using what we call uh, uh, intelligent B modeling. And, and this is, you can say, a workhorse of, a, of what when we, we are, are doing efficient concept development today, because this type of approach is very, very fast. If you compare simulations uh, running with this methodology, we talk about maybe 
five to 20 minutes. In comparison, if you do a full scale crash simulation uh, or engage simulation, you, may, you might need hours or, or days to, to complete that. Of course, then uh, when we have run and uh, gotten a certain maturity, you need to take this into, into a, a shell model to do the final concept development and hand over to mainstream development. Just a few words about MDO. Uh, MDO, as I said, is a combination. There we have a tool called MDO Director. And the purpose of that tool is, and of that process is to take a main body. And, and with this body, you can define uh, a lot of design uh, uh, variables and you uh, define your responses. And you do that by looking at, at different load cases. So here we can consider all the different attributes that we want to uh, consider in the development. And then we run big DOEs, uh, developing uh, response surface models uh, out of these uh, DOEs. And these with these response uh, surface models, we can then execute design exploration and, and optimization. So this is a, a, a very efficient type of, of uh, working procedure if you use it in the right way. It generates a lot of decision material and uh, it helps design departments to evaluate different scenarios and different trade-offs between reaching uh, uh, goals of minimizing the weight or or maximizing stiffness or uh, fulfilling the, the, the crash requirements in the best way. So just a, a final slide, see if we can see this. This is just to give, it, give you a little bit uh, visual on, on how the C1, 2, 3 process works. So here we work with a few different vehicles. We say we develop a, a, a D, a D uh, segment SUV first, you look at the uh, load paths of these uh, of this DSUV. Then you start to develop the other uh, vehicles more or less uh, simultaneously. You look at carryover content. You look at, at uh, what do I need as the same structures uh, and what do I need as separate structures uh, for the different vehicles. Then you turn this into what we said is the C2 phase, uh, doing a lot of trade-offs between uh, the different uh, goals for the development and when it's shaking down we can go into a, a complete and, and a 3D model to verify the design and hand over this to, to the uh, uh, serious development. So okay now I've been uh, talking about electric motor development using simulation driven design we've talked about uh, uh, light weighting uh, in the area of, of body body development and as the next I would like to hand over to to Jean-Michel to take you through a little bit of what we're doing on the battery side so thank you very much. Uh, good morning everybody I will uh, focus uh, my uh, okay can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. So I will uh, focus on a part of the electric vehicle, which is the battery pack. Uh, it's only one component of the electric vehicle, but in fact, it's a very important one, especially when we are speaking about safety uh, regarding crash or other event. Uh, what can happen? If you look at the uh, um, batteries, uh, you can have some mechanical loading, which will create a huge deformation and internal short circuit. You can have some evolution of the uh, interior of the batteries. We can make some rupture in the separator, for example, which can create internal short circuit. If you have enough internal short circuit, you can have all the electric energy due to the short circuit which will go to an increase of uh, temperature. So the increase of temperature can go to thermal runaway. And what does it mean thermal runaway in a pack? It means a combustion which uh, will be unstable. 
and a combustion which is stable, which gives you a deflagration. So the risk of the batteries is quite high to go to an energetic reaction. And it's very important not only to know how to uh, model and to understand the mechanical answer of the battery, but also how to determine the increase of, of uh, the temperature to be able to evaluate the thermal runover risk. So it's uh, the, what we have done recently. Um, we develop a process uh, to uh, calculate, uh, to simulate with the FEA, the uh, mechanical answer of batteries, components of the full uh, battery pack, and to determine the uh, temperature. Uh, we are not focusing on the uh, degradation of the batteries, which are coming on the uh, uh, electrochemical aspect. So what is the, exactly the status? We worked uh, the last uh, three years from 2016 to 2019 with the MIT under uh, the uh, battery research group. And we worked a lot with uh, Professor Alam Charre, uh, who is now at Temple University. And uh, she developed the uh, process to homogenize the uh, material of the uh, cells to be able to build a finite element model, which is usable in a complete vehicle. Then she worked and uh, we participate a lot uh, in the uh, definition of a rupture model for this homogenized material to uh, represent the rupture inside the cells. And it's something very important uh, because uh, we will see that it will have an important effect on the uh, thermal answer of the uh, cells. So we are based on this uh, work we can see that we are able to uh, simulate correctly the behavior of a cell and by the way of a module of a battery or a battery pack. And you can see if we uh, look at the comparison between the test and simulation, we have a very good agreement. So this uh, mechanical approach can be applied on a complete electric vehicle. And you can see here it's a podium pack, which is a part of the Euro NCAP um, recommendation. And you can see that it's possible to determine the uh, displacement and the deformation at the battery level uh, with a model which is uh, usable. So if you uh, look at the uh, model of such a car, it's around uh, five to six million of elements. And the, uh, for the battery, we are adding two million of elements. So it's a thing which is uh, today the uh, standard. So we can see that uh, we have made some work and we develop a process uh, based on the work of Elam Charre and some uh, uh, added work we have done with her uh, to have the mechanical answer. So now how to determine the thermal increase, which is very important because the goal is to evaluate the risk of fire. So we have uh, worked with uh, Professor Jung Tzu, uh, who is now at the uh, North Carolina uh, University in Charlotte. Uh, he worked the last five years in uh, China at Beiyang University and he made a huge amount of uh, work on the batteries and a huge amount of uh, tests. So it's very interesting because you have, we have a lot of information regarding some parameters like the state of art and so on. So the objective of uh, the work we have done with him was to validate <coughs> the evaluation of the increase of temperature and to make comparison between tests and simulation. So you can see here the method uh, we took a very standard battery and uh, with a 30% state of charge. Uh, we have done three different tests, a compression, a indentation, and a three-point bending. And you can see uh, the FEA models. So the first step has been the mechanical uh, modeling and we applied the uh, method I presented. Then uh, the goal was to uh, determine the electric characteristics. So some tests has been done um, to have the, uh, uh, I would say, some uh, internal short circuit inside the cells, and it allowed to uh, determine the short circuit resistivity inside the cell. And uh, then some uh, uh, analysis of the test has been done to determine at which uh, level of compression, uh, if I take the compression test, uh, we began to have some internal short circuit. Okay, and we, for example, uh, in this uh, test, you can see uh, we have the simulation, which is in very good agreement with the experiment. And we have, uh, we can uh, find in the uh, test that we have the internal short circuit at around 0.5, uh, 5, uh, 0.2 uh, 
millimeters of deformation. Simulating uh, the process, we can estimate that we have begun to have the internal short circuit in this uh, kind of cell for 43% of deformation. So it's a very important uh, uh, um, value because uh, based on this value, increasing the deformation, we uh, begin to have the power loss inside the model, okay, inside the cell. And what is important is to have the power loss curve in uh, as a function of the strain inside the material. So uh, based on the uh, simulation of the test, we are able to determine this curve, which is very important. So what is the methodology we develop? We have a two approach, the micro scale simulation. So based on the component of the uh, uh, cells, we are able to determine the uh, characteristic of the homogeneous material and to calculate the answer, the mechanical answer or the cells, or the module, or the completely battery pack. And we are using radios, our crash code. Then, uh, based on the different level of deformation inside the material, uh, we are able to calculate, taking into account the uh, uh, level of uh, internal short circuits, uh, we are able to calculate the electric uh, flow inside the uh, material. And by the way, to determine the power density as a function of the deformation. And this power density combined with the uh, strain inside the material after the loading or during the loading, the mechanical loading, we can calculate the transient thermal uh, answer of the material to determine the field of temperature at the end of the uh, process or during the, uh, uh, the, the uh, crash or the loading. So we have the mechanical answer and based on the uh, power density uh, curve, we are able to determine also the temperature fit. So if I take the uh, different tests we saw here, we have the compression test. You can see in black, uh, we have the uh, mechanical answer. In red, we have the thermal answer. Uh, the continuum curves are the test and the uh, dash curves are the simulation. And we can see that we have a very good agreement in terms of mechanical answer, but also in terms of thermal answer. And in this case of test, we can see that we move from around 25 degrees Celsius to uh, 35 degrees Celsius. So we have uh, around 10 degrees Celsius increase of temperature inside the material. And the uh, measurement has been done just as a center in the middle of the cell. If I look at the indentation, it's the same, we have the same kind of curve and we can see a very good agreement between simulation and test. And we can see that we have a little more increase of temperature at the center of the uh, cell. Uh, we are increasing by 20 degrees Celsius. So the, the model we have is uh, able and the methodology we built is able to determine the increase of temperature. And based on this increase of temperature, we can determine in which zone we can reach uh, 120 degrees Celsius, which is a very important value because at this value, we begin to have the melting of the separator. And then of course, the system becomes to be instable. Uh, only point for the three point bending test, we don't have any damage which create an internal short circuit. So uh, we have the capability to uh, determine the risk of thermal runover. And we decided to work on a, a, um, a tool which is a battery director, uh, which will include uh, the capability to take a different kind of loadings like a crash, crush, drop, shock with and without uh, penetration, uh, deceleration, and to design the uh, completely battery pack. That means at the cell level, the module, and the uh, completely uh, complete battery pack uh, under these uh, different loadings, and to optimize the, the uh, um, the way the battery is uh, uh, designed, as well as uh, the behavior inside a full vehicle. It's a three years uh, project, so we, are, uh, we have a first tool and we want to continue the next three years. Uh, we are uh, creating uh, some consortium with OEMs and battery manufacturers. We are involving, of course, Professor Jungsu at the uh, North Carolina University, as well as a research center like uh, the Front Author Institute. So if you have a, see if you are interested by our project and by our knowledge and how we are uh, developing the batteries, uh, you are welcome to contact us. Thank you very much for your attention. 
Lars and Jean-Michel, thank you very much for that presentation, the insight into these simulation tools. I have several questions. We have about nine minutes left, so I think we can get to some of these questions effectively. Jean-Michel, uh, to me, the battery is a, is a fundamental um, design hub for BEVs, makes it different than, than the traditional internal combustion engines, um, and allows the designers, the simulators, to take a very different perspective on the vehicle. How is that difference optimized optimiz in optimization, the difference between optimizing around the battery and optimizing around an internal combustion engine? How is that taken into account in your simulation? The, the optimization uh, uh, is, uh, first of all, the work has to be done at the uh, battery level uh, to uh, optimize the answer of the battery. Uh, especially, uh, as I told you, uh, regarding the, uh, the thermal aspect and the increase of uh, uh, the uh, uh, temperature. Um, so it's based on the uh, different kind of cell which can be used, the, uh, the way the module are defined, uh, the, uh, uh, the stack of the uh, different cells or the different modules. And then uh, the pack is very important. Today you have, some, uh, you have the regulation which imposed to have a no deformation of the batteries. Uh, we see in the uh, research which has been done that uh, it's possible to uh, consider some deformation. So the goal is to uh, look where we can accept deformation of the batteries and then to redesign the pack uh, to reduce the mass. So the, 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 this work uh, is can be completely embedded in the uh, C123 approach, which has been presented by Lars. It's more at the C2 and C3 level of course, because uh, we are focusing on one component, but it's uh, something which is important because the, the, the pack of battery is quite big and uh, it, it brings a lot of mass, a lot of rigidity, which has some influence on the NVH, on the dynamic of the vehicle. So uh, being able to uh, modify and to improve the uh, pack of the battery will uh, uh, improve quite a lot uh, and is improving quite a lot uh, the electric vehicle uh, globally. Another point, uh, we see that uh, between OEMs and uh, battery manufacturers, uh, battery manufacturers are looking at the energy they can put inside the battery. The OEMs are looking at the uh, global behavior of the vehicle and a such approach is a good uh, connection between these two worlds. Very good, thanks. I'll, I'll come back to that, that in a moment. Lars, expanding a little bit on, on the, the, the optimization for the battery electric vehicle in your simulations. You've spoke of mass reduction and light weighting. Are there differences? As you point out, mass reduction, light weighting has been around for quite some time. Are there differences that you find in simulation in, in finding optimization for electrified battery electric vehicles compared to others? And, and, and again, back to you, how does, if so, how does your system um, play that out? Yes, uh, when it comes to structure development, I would say that that uh, many uh, traditional developments has been based on the principle of uh, predecessor and successor when it comes at least to the classical uh, internal combustion engine development. So you take one predecessor and you do quite small updates of that uh, to get up to your successful successor uh, vehicle. And that's something we see in many, many companies. However, mm -hmm. that's completely different for, for when you start looking into the battery electric vehicles because there are so many completely different packaging requirements and, and packagings that need to be considered. A few things are getting uh, uh, are, are gone, let's say. Other things are come, uh, coming uh, on top of it. And this means that uh, the way you have to, to work with load paths, both for crash and NVH, is changing completely. And also, uh, also concerning requirements, it's it's changing dramatically because in a few years with our uh, internal combustion engine, the the noise of the engine was uh, was so to speak uh, hiding uh, a lot of other noises uh, from yeah. from the road, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is of course completely different today. So it's a, it's a it's both a challenge but also provide a lot of new design freedom and that we use that is excellent uh, 
to utilize using these uh, C1 processes where you look at load path development early in concept phase. Thank you. I want to, Jean Michel, if I can come back to you and, and one of our, our listeners is going to put you on the spot and, and maybe we can work around choosing which of your which of your partners customers is your favorite but um the uh, question is which oem currently which is which oem is currently industry leader in battery design and why are european manufacturers falling behind um if you want to go down that path you can if not let's see if we can build around it to talk about what are what are some of the um leading uh, best best in class ideas out there um in battery um, design. Oh. Okay, uh, we are working with many OEMs and yes. with the uh, battery manufacturers. We can see that um, companies like BYD in China are very advanced because they are working on both sides, on the uh, batteries as well on the uh, vehicles. And they are developing electric vehicles for many, many years. Okay, it's the same if I take um, another group, uh, which is Renault Nissan, uh, they develop their own batteries and uh, now they are working with uh, um, Envision, but um, okay. So we see uh, some, uh, we see some companies who enter inside the electric vehicle uh, many years ago and who uh, learn quite a lot and, uh, and uh, uh, are understanding better and better yeah. the uh, specificity of the electric vehicle on, on the batteries uh, they, they are respecting some rules okay they did not make so much simulation and uh, today uh, doing uh, the approach we have to uh, determine the uh, thermal increase based on the mechanical uh, aspect we we can uh, see that uh, the, the rules they are applying can be explained by the behavior of the batteries and what they use today and we will see uh, the evolution of the uh, batteries also because uh, uh, the uh, batteries uh, we have today will not uh, be the one we will use in five or ten years okay mm -hmm. so we will see uh, a, a huge um, evolution of the uh, batteries on the uh, um, energy they can deliver as well uh, the aspect of safety which is uh, quite important very helpful thank you uh, lars we just have a couple of moments left i want to come back quickly to a question um back to the, the mass reduction and the question was for which components of an electric vehicle do you see the biggest potential for light weighting in the next three to five years so over the next product cycle what are what are the key um components that you see as candidates for mass reduction i i still see uh that the since the, the the bodies are becoming are looking completely different than they did uh, five to ten years ago with internal combustion engine engines i still think there is a lot of potential combining different lightweighting technologies for for the body still and if you count uh, the the most potential in terms of absolute mass i definitely think that that uh, there's a lot of things to 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 get down there but I think was definitely on the battery side, battery and battery tray side, uh, battery efficiency will <coughs> increase because then you can also decrease mass of the battery. So there you have a, a big, big, big chunk of mass, I think. The battery is very, very heavy. To reduce yeah. that mass is really important. Last question, and I appreciate um, first all the good questions from the audience and, and, and second, Lars and Jean-Michel, your, your willingness to answer. Last one, simulations are only as good as data used to build the model. What advice can you provide data scientists supporting product development who are working to secure the best data to inform these models? Either one of you want to take a shot at that? To get, How do you get the best data? So, sorry, I did not understand the question. Yeah, that's, that's fair. So the, the question kind of comes down to, what advice can you give data scientists in helping determine what is the best data? How to use, again, any model is only as good as the data used. How do you get good data? Uh, the data, uh, <clears throat> for the mechanical behavior, okay, we are doing, uh, it's important to do the tests on the uh, uh, different material which are stacked in the cells. 
and then to validate uh, on the uh, on some test on the uh, different cells uh, the uh, the model. On the electric aspect, it's the same. It's to uh, do some tests and to uh, validate the characteristics. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, short circuit resistivity. It's important to uh, do some tests to validate the values. Uh, it's uh, what we have done uh, uh, with uh, both uh, Professor Alam, Share, and uh, Professor Junzu. We have reached the end of this webinar. Lars Fredrickson, Jean-Michel Terrier, excuse me. Thank you both for, for presenting today to the audience. Thank you very much for your time. I hope this was valuable. Please feel free to contact any of us if you have further information requests. Thank you very much. Have a great day.